Hey, I'm Mark Clem, your host for Meet the Members of the National Ski Patrol, and as we always say, all season long. Folks, I know the season's over. It came to an abrupt end uh, several weeks ago with the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. And uh, we as ski patrollers kind of stomped away and uh, decided we didn't want it to end. And we went in the back country and got in a little bit of trouble. And um, we finally, after a little while, said, well, you know, I guess it's over. So we, we drug our skis and stomped our feet and said, I guess the season's over. But you know how ski patrollers are. Nothing is ever over. We can't sit around and just do nothing and sit back. So um, um, ski patrollers do what they do. They're, they're active all season long, whether it be training, whether it be community service, whether it be helping out with events and providing EMS care with running races and bike races and things like that. Well, last week or so, I came across um, a bunch of patrollers who are out there um, fighting the fight of the um, the COVID-19 virus, and um, I'm learning more and more that there's patrollers out there that are going above and beyond and trying to um, help the EMS providers and the doctors and nurses and the care providers and, and everybody um, just fight through this, this mess we got here. So we created um, Meet the Members of the National Ski Patrol special COVID-19 episodes, and we're in, this will be episode number two. And we're here with Brad Hess and his family. Um, Sydney and Ryan are back there. Um, and uh, how, how are you guys doing down there in Virginia? Good, good. Staying, staying put, staying safe. And uh, we're uh, normally, you know, um, Brad, you've seen me do these interviews before. Normally we're out on snow, we're having fun, skiing around the mountain and talking about how much fun we have patrolling. But a little more serious time here. And uh, you have your, your family, Sydney and Ryan, involved in this project. And um, just uh, I'm going to just say what I know. And you guys jump in. I know that you guys are making face shields. Um, right. that's, that's all I know, really. So um, I guess how did that start, making the face shields? And where do you distribute them? Yeah, so it, it all started. Um, I run two nonprofit maker spaces in Loudoun County, Virginia. So we have tools and equipment for people to make things. And some of the equipment that we have is we have a big laser cutter. Um, we have a bunch of 3D printers, um, CNC machines. And this all started, actually, there's another makerspace closer to DC um, that put a, a shout out. Hey, who has 3D printers? Who can help us? Um, we all, I jumped, coordinated with that team. And basically, we grabbed a bunch of um, what's called pet plastic um, from a vendor out in um, Annapolis. Little did I know that that stuff was going to disappear before we could do it. Uh, or <laughs> we got we got 40 sheets. I went to order 40 another 40 sheets a week later, and they were back ordered until July. Right. Um, so we've partnered with them. Um, what we're doing is we're doing distributed manufacturing where we've got our members have either come in and taken one of our 3D printers home, or they had their own 3D printers at their house already. They're printing, and I'll I'll grab one of the face shields here. So. Oh, uh, see yeah. that but they're printing this headband part. Okay. Uh -huh. And they're also printing this bottom part. Then what we do is we have them drop them off at our space. We, we actually laser cut this space shield portion here. Um, the whole, the reason we're using pet plastic is they can be autoclave. They can be sterilized using normal hospital techniques. We also have, we've run out of the pet plastic. So we're also now doing ones using three hole punch and transfer sheets. Remember those good old overhead projectors we grew oh, up yeah. with the magic markers? That's well, crazy. finally they've come around to, to a good use. So we're using that plastic to actually make these face shields. Um, now, where, let me break in a little bit. Yeah. Where, how did you kind of come up with the idea and how did it get started actually, I guess? Yeah, so um, there's a huge community of makers out there and there's actually, um, a, a bunch of different groups on open source PPE. Mm -hmm. And the design itself is actually was done in the Czech Republic. Um, it was released about five to six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was done by a 3D printer manufacturer. That was their design. Right. Um, so far to date, I would, um, uh, with all of the different groups, 
that are doing these across the country, I would, and this is a pure guesstimate based upon what I know, I would say that the maker community has distributed about 50,000 of these across wow. the United States. That's pretty cool. Um, between our two teams being the, the team, uh, Nova Labs team and the Makersmith team, we've distributed about 1,800 in the area. Um, we have another seven or 800 that are ready to go as needed. So we're distributing to a, a couple of different uh, partners, a couple of different groups. So uh, there's a organization in Virginia that distributes medical supplies within the state to the organization with the most need. So um, we deliver them directly to them and then they take them and distribute them throughout the state. So we don't ultimately know who the end providers are. We also are distributing them to local providers, local nursing homes. Um, and we've gotten recent requests for a lot of dental hygienists oh, and wow. dental because they, they just can't get what they normally get. Right. Um, we're also distributing to all the local fire departments and EMS. Mm -hmm. um, so all the Loudoun County we've distributed to most of the volunteer organization and now some of the paid are starting to ask for it also. Now, did you um, so, guys have a good, go ahead. No, go ahead. Did you guys have a goal when actually, when did you start this project? If you can did remember start, roughly the date. Yeah, we started it about three weeks ago. And did um, you start out with a goal? Like, did you pick a number and say, well, it would be great to get to that goal. No. No, we just, we, we basically started down this path of, you know, at that point in time, we didn't know what the demand was and we still don't know, you know, Virginia has been pretty stable light right now. And, you know, been pretty good about keeping their caseload, you know, in check. Um, but we don't know what, what it'll bring. So we're just, we're, you know, making them and everything that we've made so far has been claimed, <laughs> you know, oh, we wow. have, you know, uh, we were in, I was in there yesterday. Um, so, Going back to how we're doing this, say everybody's printing at home, they drop parts off at our maker space, and then there's a team of four people that we go in with full masks, gloves, and basically put everything that comes in into a bleach solution, sanitize everything, and then as soon as it comes out of the bleach solution, it goes into a Ziploc bag, it's dated. We don't distribute it for at least three days after it goes into the Ziploc bag. That way we, it, you know, we can take all practical that if I'm printing at home, and I have it and I don't know it, at least right. we're not passing it on. Um, so we're taking every precaution that we can from that perspective. So. Now you have Sydney and Ryan back there in the background. I know I've met Sydney, um, cheered Sydney on in her ski racing career at, um, at Whitetail and around, around, actually around the East Coast. We saw you guys up, up north skiing and all that. And we got Ryan way in the back. How did you get, how did you make this a family affair, grabbing, Ryan and Sydney involved. So Sydney's my lead co-assembler. She's one of the people that goes into the into our maker space and actually assembles these things together. Um, she also has been running some laser cutter and and doing that stuff and helping out there. Ryan's my 3D guy. He's he's the one that you know. It takes about three or four hours to print these things, wow. and he he checks the printer, pulls the old one off, and pulls the new one, puts the new one, or starts the new one and lets it go because. You know, I'm in, I'm in meeting. I'm working from home, so I'm in meetings all day. Right. And you know, it's easier to hey, go do this, um, which has been great because we've actually so we we purchased a 3D printer to do this. We didn't have one at home, so he's he's put some of his projects in there every now and then as we have some downtime too. So, well, it sounds like it's all fun, and you've got the family in and and um in this era of social distancing and I guess self quarantine. It's um you've got a big project and it's it's all working. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a lot of fun and, you know, it's been a, a great experience to connect with the maker movement across the United States. I'm a member of a couple different organizations there and there's some amazing stuff that maker spaces are doing right now. You know, there's a, a maker space, um, Kansas city, that's basically cranking these out. They're cranking thousands out a day. Um, cause they, it's a full-time maker space and that is his job is running this. Um, and he's doing a, a laser cut design um, there, you know, and then there's a or, couple organizations that are making open source um, ventilators. There's all kinds of really cool innovation coming out of this. Now, I'd just like to like to say that um, Brad um, and Sydney and you guys, you ski at Whitetail Ski Resort um, up in Pennsylvania. 
You remember the Whitetail Ski Patrol for a handful of years now, and um, you're donating that great brand new Whitetail Ski Patrol hat I see. That's pretty there cool. You might have to get me one of them. And um, but your 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 residence, your home is down near in the Leesburg area. Is that is that right? Correct. Yep. So that's um, for all you people out there that have no idea where Leesburg, Virginia is. I'm in Frederick, Maryland. And you guys are, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes away down in Virginia? Yeah. And what, yep. what are you, about an hour and 15 from the mountains? Something about an like hour. That? Yeah, about an hour and 15. So this is kind of like a whole regional event here. And in, in Sydney, you go to Whitetail and practice three, four, five times a week. So um, um, this isn't ski racing, but it's keeping you busy and it's, it's uh, helping you get involved. And Sydney, how much fun have you had and how much fun have you had, Ryan, working on this project and knowing that you're you're helping out in some some way um it's really fun yeah we just go and like assemble it gets very repetitive so you just kind of get in the yeah um, it just, it's like making laps on the race course when yeah. when your coaches say do it again do it again is that right <laughs> yeah and Ryan, how about you? You, you said, I think you're the boss back there. You're the kind of the one that makes the show work, right? You are the boss. Um, Ryan, if you don't get them made, if you don't get them cut, we can't assemble anything, right? So, yeah, basically, it's been running um, for the school meeting. And um, basically, it's created about an eighth. An eighth, like a millimeter. Right. Um, array on the, on the behind van and yeah so behind i don't know yeah i can see a little bit yeah get out of the way so there's two 3d printers going um actually i'm gonna i should have done this on my phone but that's okay you can see the design starting to shape take shape there yeah being laid out in the plastic so well that's pretty cool and i just like to uh, also preference that um and we talk about this often on our show that, um, you know, 95% of the patrollers out there are running the whole 33,000 members of the National Ski Patrol are volunteers. We're not making a dime. And um, you guys are doing this, um, you know, above and beyond, um, trying to help your family survive this this big ordeal that we're going through. And and we'd always like to take our hats off to folks like like you guys, Brett, and your, fam your family and the whole bit, and, or Brad, I mean. And um, just thank you for what you're doing. And um, hopefully you feel proud that you're, you're helping out. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, you know, this has been fun. This is, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons we started the makerspace was to grow a community of people, right? right. And to have a people, a community of people that can come together and make things. And, you know, we're, we're a nonprofit. We're making nothing off of this back for outlaying cash and we'll figure out how it comes back later. Um, you know, helping the community out as much as we can. Um, Speaking of that, um, how can somebody help you guys out? Is there, can, can they drop off supplies? Can they donate money or how can that happen? So there, the, the, you can donate, but honestly, we've, we've raised quite a bit of funds right now. Um, what I'd rather, since we're a national organization is have them look for a local maker space that they can support. Almost every makerspace in the country right now is doing this. So right. reach out to your local makerspace. Um, be happy to share with you my email address so that if somebody right. wants me to connect them, I can connect them to that okay. local makerspace. Um, but our space is in really good shape right now. Um, other spaces are not in such great shape. You know, they don't have, we've got a, a pretty good community, but there's a lot of little makerspaces out there that are doing this that don't have as big and vast a community. Um, and I'd like to have, you know, support local, you know, right. Support our organization is we've got our local support, but I'd rather have people really reach out to their local makerspace and they're, they're out there and they're doing the same thing. I don't know of one makerspace in the country that is not making these things. Wow, well, that's, that's really good. Yeah. We really appreciate that. And um, I guess, do you have a plan on how long you want to continue the project or are you just going to go as, as the need is as as the need exists we're gonna go um and so i got a request this morning um to actually hey would you guys ship them and so what we're, we're doing now is we're gonna pack some up and we're gonna ship some to uh michigan and we're gonna ship some to new york city 
um, areas where they need. So we feel like we're getting the point. We're going to hold back for local. You know, we're going to keep 100 units in for local that, for immediate. Uh, but we got to get them to the areas that they really need them. So. And there you go, folks. Just another way that the uh, the great um, family of the members of the National Ski Patrol, all 33,000 strong, um, we're all out there doing our part as much as we can. We might not be as um, extraordinary as what Brad and his family gets to do, but the little things matter. And um, again, I always pub up the National Ski Patrol. Hey, if if you, you guys ever want to get involved out there, the guys that haven't made that step yet and watch the videos all the time, watch the show, hey, all you got to do is pick up the phone and call your local um, ski mountain and ask for the ski patrol director. Obviously, we're all shut down right now, so you're not going to get a hold of anybody. You can log on to www.nsp.org. And Megan Mozinski and Beckett Stokes and the folks out at the national office in Lakewood, Colorado will definitely steer you in the right direction. But if you call today, be patient because they're shut down as well. Again, Brad, um, tip my hat to you and Sydney and Ryan back there for just doing your part and taking the extra step and going the extra mile. Appreciate it. Good chatting with you. All right. Again, I'm Mark Clem, your host for Meet the Members of the National Ski Patrol from right here in the confines of the offices here in Frederick, Maryland. We're reaching out to you folks all over the country. Hey, if you're a if you're a ski patroller or if you, you know someone that's a ski patroller that's doing things like Brad's doing or, or anything to help fight the fight, hey, pick up the phone and give me a call at 240-674-1855 or hit me up on mclem at comcast.net and tell me your story. We want to interview and we want to get all this information out there. Again, like I said yesterday in our very first special edition, there's always room in the bandwagon because I'm coming to a mountain near you. but today. I can't put you in there. We got to do some self distancing and, and all that stuff. So there won't be any rides in the bandwagon until the snow falls next year. Again, see you on down the road. I'm Mark Clemford. Meet the members of the National Ski Patrol. Mm -hmm.